Hello, my name is Peter Campbell. I'm the Financial Times Global Motor Industry Correspondent. And today I'm going to be taking you through some of the clips from last year's Future of the Car Summit and analysing how the industry trends have played out over the course of the last year. Let's go to the first clip. Right now, what we see in the automotive industry is very much linked to, to, to software. So the industry's shift to software takes the car manufacturers far outside of their traditional comfort zones. They're really, really good at making, producing hardware. But moving to software requires a very different set of skills and a very different set of staff to make it work. So the efforts that everybody's making is to make sure that uh, you are you are able to, to, to ensure the same level of reliability of the software part uh, as as we have been to do as an industry on the hardware part. It's a different game. Some of the world's big software companies have been thinking about making vehicles, and they've discovered that it's very hard to manufacture cars at scale to automotive-grade quality. And the car makers thought it would be much easier for them to move into software. But those who've tried it so far have found the process much more taxing and much slower than they previously expected. Uh, some cars now have probably more lines of codes of a Boeing 747. So it's another world and this is the challenge for everybody. That's what we're doing at least. We're putting a lot of people on, on, on the software quality uh, part of the story. There's a huge divide in the industry at the moment between those who want to make all the software themselves in-house to try and control the customer experience in the car, to try and control the relationship with the customer in the car, and those who are quite happy to make the hardware and farm out the software to someone else. So when Luca DeMeo talks about the car companies getting into software, what they really need is the staff and the coders who can write that software. Now we're in a time at the moment when software is eating the world, to use the famous quote. And that means car companies are competing not just against tech companies, but against almost every other business to try and hire established coders who can help them crack the software nut. Uh, on the chip shortage side, I think you have two aspects that we need to look at. On the one hand, the short term thing that we're all talking about, the reallocation in the second quarter of some of the chip makers, maybe to uh, other uh, entertainment electronic and, and computer electronic uh, customers. Then the unfortunate uh, winter storm in Texas and uh, fire in the plant in Japan and so on, things that have compounded the situation here in the first half year. Those more uh, tactical uh, uh, issues, they will be resolved. In one sense, the problem the car industry has had with chip shortages over the last couple of years should be a short-term issue. It's something that will be resolved this year or maybe next, and then everybody can forget about it. But what the crisis has done is exposed quite how vulnerable the car makers are and their manufacturing operations are to snags further down the supply chain. In future, some of the car makers are now seriously thinking about whether they need to do really core components, such as chips, actually in-house. But there is an underlying pressure on the chip side with vehicles getting more sophisticated, more, more content. Also, volume makers putting content into vehicles that perhaps was only found in premium and luxury vehicles before. So there you have an additional layer of pressure that uh, may affect us beyond the resolution of this immediate uh, chip shortage situation. A lot of the changes that we're seeing in the industry, particularly the rise of electric vehicles, leads to big questions about how the car makers structure their supply chains. The old question of how much do you do in-house and how much do you buy in from another supplier has never been more prescient than it is today with the industry on the cusp of the electric vehicle revolution. For car makers, the desire to want to make their batteries themselves or want to source their chips themselves or want to do any number of other technological things in-house is very sensible in order for them to protect their security of supply in the future and stop them being exposed to another global supply chain crunch. But it takes them far outside of their comfort zones. It means they suddenly need to become experts in chips and batteries, which are a long way away from what they're currently very, very good at. And I think we need to look at you know, how the supply chain for electric vehicles is segmented. So there's not going to be enough battery capacity in Europe. 
you know, China has a, a large EV industry and they have 117 factories. The European Union, including the UK, has actually overtaken China this this in, in the last 12 months as the largest EV market. And we have six gigafactories in, in, the, in, in the European Union. So there were lots of issues thrown up by the need to secure battery supply for electric vehicles in the future. A big one of those is where to get the batteries from and who do you partner with? Do you partner with an existing battery manufacturer? Some of the Asian giants are very good at it. Do you try and develop your own in-house technology? And how do you ensure that you're able to get the batteries when you need them to make your electric vehicles in the future? There's also a really interesting geopolitical element to the race to get batteries. Many governments who have major car makers in their jurisdictions want to get battery factories in their countries in order to protect the current large number of automotive jobs they have in the supply chain and in the car factories, which are going to be directly threatened by the shift to electric vehicles. There's going to be a capacity constraint by the middle of this decade. So battery capacity, then the active material manufacturing capacity to feed the, to feed the gigaplants, and then look at the the supply chain for the raw materials. So we, we need to be doing this in parallel to make sure that we can come on stream with enough capacity to make sure the EV industry grows from the middle of this decade onwards. There's also the key issue of how you secure the supply of the raw materials that goes into those batteries. Everything from lithium to cobalt to nickel to copper is required to make an electric vehicle battery. Now, car makers are not currently investing in mines but it's something they have to make sure they're able to get in the future because if you have an ambitious electric vehicle program, you don't want to be, it to be held up by snags further down your supply chain. The cars, the electric cars of the future will be about technology and efficiency and efficiency will drive down cost as well as optimizing range. For so many years, the established car makers have looked at those who want to enter the industry and believed that the rigours of manufacturing cars at scale and at quality is going to keep the other people outside the industry. What Tesla has shown and what some of the others are in the process of showing is that it is possible for people to come in from outside and to be able to make cars. And that for the industry, for the established industry, is one of the greatest threats. Every time we see a new company enter the car industry making electric vehicles with great promise and great aplomb, it's always difficult to see how they're going to manufacture the cars. Every single business that has tried to enter the industry from Tesla to Neo to Lucid to Rivian has struggled with the basic job of manufacturing the cars at quality and at scale. Uh, I have no fear in that respect that we can be tech leaders this is about scale and access to capital and walking before you can run. And Lucid needs to walk and we need to get Lucid Air into production with laser focus before we do the next car. And that's Project Gravity for 2023. And, and anything else is, is, is way out in the future. I've got laser focus on delivering our first product right now. That's what this company needs. One issue around whether startups can crack the manufacturing issue which is one of the big moats holding them outside the industry, is whether or not they can afford to put up with the delays that this is going to incur. Now, many of these companies have raised money at incredible valuations on the stock market, and that actually makes them more tolerant of having losses like this. It means they can burn more money, whereas a traditional car maker, if they were trying to make the jump and struggling with production delays, would actually be far more financially penalised. We all remember a few years ago when Tesla went through what they called production hell, when they couldn't actually manufacture the Model 3 fast enough or at high enough quality. They're now through the other side of that. And that has shown all of the startups trying to get into this industry, everyone from Lucid to Rivian to all of the others, that it is possible with enough perseverance and enough pain to break through the wall. Um, in China, the, the, every mile, there are hundreds of thousands of objects that you're going to interact with, the vehicles, the bikers. Um, these help us um, to go into urban scenarios. So we have been testing in the downtown of Shenzhen for almost four years um, with all of that data. Also, we're in Shanghai, we're in other cities as well. Uh, that helps us to deal with a very dense urban scenario.
So, look, there's a big debate at the moment among people developing autonomous vehicles as to whether being able to test them and get them to work in a really dense, busy, difficult urban environment helps you to scale and means when you go to other places, it's going to be much easier to roll those cars out. Uh, right. With that experience, when we go to Las Vegas, it was relatively easy. So it um, depends on where you're talking about. One of the big problems that people trying to scale autonomous cars have is once you've developed and tested in one location, when you move somewhere else, you still have to put in the really in-detailed mapping and learn all the streets of that area before you can then transfer your autonomous vehicles over. That makes scaling autonomous vehicles, even once you've got them to work in one place that might be as difficult or as complex as downtown Shenzhen, it's still very difficult to get those to work somewhere else in the world. Well, I hope those clips have given you a flavour of the things that are happening in the industry that we talked about last year. If you'd like to hear more about digitisation, decarbonisation or any of the changes happening in the industry, join us this year when we'll be talking to a host of world-leading experts, from Elon Musk to the chief executives of Renault, Mercedes-Benz, Volvo, Lucid and Waymo, and the European Transport Commissioner at this year's FT Future of the Car Summit taking place at the brewery in London, as well as online from the 9th to the 12th of May.